With this said, I'd like to introduce Professor Yoru Wang, who is Professor of World Religions at Rowan University. He's been here for quite some time and is one of our most distinguished faculty members. We are thrilled to have him here today to talk to us about empathy in the Taoist classic, Zhuang Zi. Thank you, uh, Edward, for introducing me. <clears throat> uh, before I start my presentation, first uh, uh, try to spread some information about this philosopher and uh, the book. So <clears throat> I'm just, I'm just I can point to the, the name, Zhuangzi. Uh, for Americans, it's difficult to pronounce zi, the second uh, song. You can use a kind of long utterance, zi, and cut a short. Become zi, so zhuang zi. A personal name, as I put here, zhuang zi, uh, two spellings from different uh, <coughs> traditions. Personal name, zhuang zhou. So zhou is his pers uh, first name. Uh, uh, um, <coughs> yeah, first, first name. And the life was spent 369 to 286 before Common Era. So his time is later than Plato, Plato 5th century to 4th century. And uh, I have some notes here. 20 years <coughs> early than the birth of Aristotle. <coughs> but uh, Aristotle died earlier than Zhuangzi, so Zhuangzi a little bit, <coughs> live longer than Aristotle. So basically, we will know um, roughly they live close. So he is the second greatest philosopher in history of Darwinism. Before he was Lao Tzu, the old master. I didn't put it here. Now quickly move to the book. So called uh, Taoist classic uh, Zhuangzi. So far, we have a version of this book in third century. Oh, okay. Third century common era. So almost like uh, 500 years later. That's what we are reading in Chinese. Not to mention a lot of English translations. Uh, most uh, recent uh, translation by uh, University of Chicago Chair Professor uh, Zipporin is very good uh, philosophical translation, published in 2020. But uh, that book uh, <coughs> was published, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> a little allergy like <laughs> hello, 240 uh, before Common Era. 50 years after Master's death, so it's all later. And uh, other historical records shows us that uh, there were 52 chapters, but currently we only see 33 chapters, either in Chinese original or English translations. So now I focus on my topic. Um, in order to talk about this philosopher and this book, I first focus on Western scholarship on empathy. Otherwise, I don't have an interpretive tool to give a contemporary interpretation of empathy, of Zhuangxing view on empathy. So I follow four aspects based on my reading of so many uh, articles, books, I call it's an outpouring of publication in Western scholarship on empathy. So people become crazy about that. I guess earliest was uh, with President Obama once in his lecture talk about we should have empathy towards those less fortunate, more needy. Then after the media turn the turn to empathy. And uh, in scholarly research, tons of articles. So every year, 
and many, many books out there from both sides of Atlantic City, now spread to uh, Asian and other continental <coughs> areas. So I summarize the four areas of this scholarship which can be used to interpret Zhuang's. So I present here four categories. I don't think I have time for number four, interaction between empathy and other human capacities, such as reasoning, rationality, and reflection. I don't think I have time. I only have 40 minutes. I'm sorry about that. So first part, different types of empathy, I will go through quickly. So my talk will relatively focus on number two, number three. Number two, other centered other centeredness of empathy. So that's about nature of empathy. So how do you define empathy? There are debates about that. Number three, empathy as a process and the role empathy plays in responsiveness to others. So empathy as a process and its role. Uh, this third part, I guess, I can give you most part from it, but uh, I may stop uh, at the uh, last part. So first type, <coughs> first part, different types. So according to contemporary scholarship, empathy has many faces. It has been called a host of different capacity, a host, all merged under the umbrella term empathy. So here I quote from Sahavi, uh, one of the quite uh, activist, active phenomenologist in Europe uh, with English publications. He said it's possible to emphasize with a cognitive, effective, and a cognitive experience of the other, i.e. with his or her beliefs, Perception, feelings, passions, volitions, desire, and uh, intentions. However, among those different aspects of empathy, two are most widely recognized. So one is called effective empathy, the other is cognitive empathy. So I use my boss uh, <coughs> citation here. Empathy is either a way of relating cognitively to others by taking up as their perspective or a way of being emotionally sensitive to them. So under many circumstances, these two aspects are intertwined. So next I connect to songs. The songs involves cases of both effective and cognitive empathy. Chapter six includes a story of renowned funeral manager Meng Sun Cai, who was able to cry with the funeral goers. This is an example of effective empathy because it is not based on a kind of involuntary emotional contagion, but on his special understanding, which is other oriented and suited to people's feelings and situations without going against the common reason. So here my uh, phrase is based on English translation of that story. Here, emotional contagion is <coughs> defined by scholar as involuntary. <coughs> Therefore, is not a true empathy. That's most scholars agree on that, almost majority. So other case, that's a one case. If you, quest, you have a question later on, you can ask me. Other cases in the songs seems closer to cognitive empathy, a so-called perspective taking. So I give you two examples, chapter seven, uh, the story about Emperor Hun Dun, that's very famous. So this emperor name is called Hun Dun. So his uh, uh, characteristic is that uh, his face cannot be recognized as ordinary human beings with ears, nose, uh, mouth, the eyes, because that's chaos. Hun in English is called chaos, chaotic. 
So he has two good friends, other two kings. So, so they feel this Hundun very nice to, me, to us. Like treat us uh, <coughs> banquet, give us gifts. If we have help, uh, we have difficulty, he help. So we should treat him back with equally nice thing. So what are we are going to do? Idea comes out of their mind. We should help change his face. So his face look like an alien. So we are not the same. No eyes, no nose, no mouth, no ears. OK, let's help him and do a good favor for him. So we dig seven holes. I went to three, four, five, six, seven. Seven holes and cause this king, this uh, <coughs> emperor, die because of bleeding too much. So that's one case. Uh, for, I would say, for perspective taking and cognitive empathy, even though it's in negative terms, you should respect uh, this person's nature, his situation, rather than oppose, impose your own. You know, we look like a human being like this. He is not. So let's do something. And we have very good will, right? Uh, so. Uh, I call it a blind uh, goodwill. So you have bad consequences, it causes his death. That's one famous example. The second is about uh, Marcus Lu and uh, Siba. So Marcus Lu has a mansion, right? Because that's a noble class, member of noble class. So uh, the Siba all of a sudden arrive in his mansion. So right, according to Confucius, a certain guest coming, friends coming, that's a happiness thing to do, so we should greet it. So he treats this bird with all humanly possible food, like drink a famous uh, wine, drink wine, the, the best wine, and offer a banquet. So just that every day treat the bird like this. So in three days, the bird died of overeating, of being treated too nicely. So that's a second example from Zhongz, also in negative terms, meaning, uh, I'm sorry, uh, after this story, the author put a certain uh, discursive expression to story by saying that, uh, how should we treat birds? like treat other human beings, treat birds. How should we treat birds? In their own way, in the way they prefer, rather than we treat them from our preferred way of life. So it's called uh, use the way of birds to treat birds, not like use human way to treat birds. So that's, I think that's a good example. So this story is negative, but uh, enjoy us to be necessary in empathic to the patient's own design, need, purpose, living condition. So they recommend we shift to patient's perspective and norm from our own. So the following, the one more example. Following statement is also based on author's empathic understanding of how the duck and the crane, the two more animals, feel about themselves aiming at the taking their perspectives to see how different their natural features and desires are from each other, and especially from strange human ideas. So that's the English translation quotation. The duck's legs are short, but if we try to lessen them, the duck will feel pain, right? The crease legs are long, but if we try to shorten them, the crew will feel grief. So we ought not to amputate what is by nature long, not to lessen what is by nature short. So I quickly finish first part. Second part, the other centeredness of empathy. Contemporary arguments, I hope this will 
be interested uh, to uh, my philosophy colleagues, <coughs> or maybe they already know. <laughs> so embodying an asymmetrical relation oneself or other, empathy has been seen as involving the other-centered givenness of an em empathically grasped experience. That's uh, uh, Sahavi's uh, definition for empathy, <coughs> phenomenologist. Some scholars use Adam Smith's view as a starting point that empathy with others means imagining beings. And so that's in 19th century, <coughs> so-called Scottish sedimentalist philosophers after David Hume. <coughs> He said recently used a lot. Imagine beings feeling as they are believed to be feeling. But the imagination of the other seems ambiguous about other centered givenness in empathic experience. So I use a contemporary uh, epistemologist uh, Steinberg 2014 uh, elaboration on that. Empathy is a way of gaining insight into what it is like to be another person. Why it might well be that in trying to ascertain what it is like to be another, one must begin by imagining what it would be like for one to be in another situation. If one is to gain empathic knowledge, one must at the very least make compensatory adjustments for no distinctions between self and other. <clears throat> so the common saying, to put one's feet in the other's shoes is critically questioned. In putting one's feet in the other's shoes, does one aim at finding out how oneself will feel or how the other feels? Think about the difference. If it only focuses on how oneself will feel, the other's perspective and its situation may not be reached ultimately. So my book differentiates two ways of taking other's perspectives. First, imagine other perspective <coughs> and imagine self perspective. The former encourages the subject to stop and think in more detail about the other person. It helps focus the attention on the detail of the situation that the other is in. The later imagines how one will think and feel oneself if one were in the other person's situation. While my boy admits that in such a simulation, one projects oneself into the other situation and only consider one's own responses to the situation. He still believes it can be used to understand those of others better. So other scholars disagree. They try to exclude so-called pseudo-empathy. What well, is pseudo-empathy here? Self-oriented perspective taking from the genuine empathy that is only other-oriented perspective taking. <clears throat> That's from Copeland. <clears throat> so in clarifying this other-centered givenness phenomenology, I uh, transfer from uh, analytical philosophers to uh, European continental philosophers. Phenomenologists emphasize the following points, one, two, three, or maybe four. Number one, they reject all those accounts of empathy that base themselves too much on internal imagination, simulation, or projection from the side of empathizer and on its mind reading function by use a theory of mind. <clears throat> That's number one. Number two, they emphasize the intuitive or directly perceptual feature of empathic experience. It's not a detached observation of an object, that's about science, <coughs> but a relational accomplishment and an embodied perception as a starting point for interaction. 
Yeah, we can come back to this. Number three is a way of engaging with other experience. Empathy involves suspending the usual assumption that both parties share the same model space, along with openness to the phenomenological difference between oneself and other. Empathy is a kind of fellow feeling. It's a genuine outrage. Outrage, I like this uh, translation. <clears throat> and the entry into the other person and his individual situation, a true and authentic transcendence of oneself. That's Max Scheler, uh, English translation 2008, but uh, published in 1947. <clears throat> This notion of self-transcendence and the openness to the difference of the other highlights the ethical significance of overcoming the centralicity of oneself through empathic experience. Not in the sense of negating oneself, but in the sense of an authentic being with others like Heideggerian being ways. <clears throat> a model of self-forgetfulness is thus involved in empathic experience. So I move to next section, direct empathic knowing and understanding in Taoist Zhuangzi. First, uh, let's see a case one, conversation about happiness of fish. So when Zhongzi and Hui his friends, rambling on the bank of the river hall, Zhongzi said, the fish swim at leisure in the river. So I see from this their happiness. So I assume they are happy. <coughs> so his uh, <coughs> friends said, how do you know the happiness of fish if you are not a fish? Right? So philosophers can, <coughs> you know, <laughs> infer many different uh, positions <laughs> from that. Zhuang said, you are not me. How do you know I don't know the happiness of fish? I must say they use the same premise here so far. The, the friend replied, oh, yes, I'm not you. So certainly I don't know what you know. And you are certainly not a fish, so that it proves you don't know the happiness of fish. <laughs> so a lot of commentary in secondary literature are Taoism, Taoist philosophy, many like from analytic side <coughs> or from European side. That's a lot. Even one book focuses on just this story. So pay attention to the last one. The early one seems to share a position that is that uh, knowledge must uh, be based on internal experience, something mental. Uh, yeah, I can call my philosophical <laughs> colleagues, because I see some scholars mention that, uh, like uh, Thomas Nagel's other minds, basically is Hui's position according to uh, several scholars. But uh, at the end, Zhuang totally subverts all of this. Let's go back to your original question. You ask me how I know the happiness of fish. It implies that you already knew. I knew it when you posed the question. So that's one of his strategy. But the last sentence is most important. I know it here on the bridge over the river hall. So that's my interpretation, a little bit different. The only difference is that uh, I connect it to empathy, empathic knowing, understanding, but others may uh, limit themselves to intuition or direct perception. Uh, connected and different. So Zhuang's position distinguishes itself from Hui's skepticism, suggests the universal theory of mind based on an inner subjective mental state, imputable to the fish, 
as a result of knowing their happiness. So Zhuangzi's knowing does not rely on his own imagination or mental projection into the effective state of the object he is contemplating. Number two, while the text indicates the use of inference, Zhuangzi here is not focusing on an inferential relation between the ob observed evidence of carefree swimming fish and uh, the conclusion about their happiness. Number three, John's final words call attention to his empathic knowing in a lived environment of embodied co-presence with fish. Here I'm very much a phenomenologist, uh, sorry to say. And my analytic colleague is not too many I have. <coughs> uh, in that particular temporal spatial context, Zhuang directly and sensitively sees, feels, registers the fish's happiness by being attuned, resonate, resonant with their swimmingly freely. That's from a contemporary scholar on uh, Taoism. But uh, he stopped there without uh, moving one step further. So I'm going to do that. So Ong is able to co-experience the joy of fish without necessarily denying his being human. Very close to the phenomenologist uh, description of empathy. Number four, Zhuang Zi opens to different ways of knowing, including empathic knowing, intuitive knowing, non-instrumental knowing. Each is given a proper place. So that's the first uh, example. Second, a tutor and his student. So Yan He, one person's name, <coughs> will be a tutor to a prince. So he worried about that. Turns out a famous minister, Zhu Bo Yu, in preparation. <coughs> so Zhu gave him some advice. It's best to physically stay close with Prince to teach him, and not to be uh, and to be ha harmonious with him in the mind, both physical and mental. If he behaves like a baby. Just be, be a baby with him. If he behaves unconventionally, just be unconventional with him. If he behaves without restraint, just be without restraint with him. So understand him thoroughly, and then lead him to the point where he is without fault. That's chapter four. So that's my interpretation following the central meaning of this passage is related to some recurring sea of this text, the so-called following along with, yielding to, being in two ways, things and others, and leading to responsiveness in a suitable manner. Number two, one of the traditional exegesis sees it as a tactic or method for success either in one's career or personal relationship. By virtue of self-control, caution, compromise, that's one interpretation. <clears throat> uh, I raised this long ago, so recently, uh, sometimes I forgot <laughs> what I wrote. <clears throat> the other sees it a second interpretation, sees it as a capacity to be cultivated and used for educational training purpose. So the first neglects the aspect of moral psychological functions. The second provides a vantage point to see importance of empathy and the indispensable role empathy will play in successful tutoring or helping others. So it's not exaggerating to claim empathy is a part of Zhuangxin pedagogy, pedagogy <coughs> in this story. As the passage hints, in order to offer an um, e effective education <coughs> or assistance in general, one must have a thorough understanding of the pupil or patient to whom one's help is directed. 
In order to attain this thorough understanding, we must have empathy. So empathic understanding is the primary condition for any prosperous interpersonal relationship. And next, the cited passage bears a striking resemblance to our contemporary terminology of empathy, such as to see what it is like to be the other person, to put oneself in the other circumstances in order to feel what the other feels and to know what the other's perspective is before one is able to judge or respond. And next, a temporary low reversal happened between prote uh, protagonist and secondary figure, between teacher and student, is involved in this emphasizing process. <clears throat> and uh, this involvement becomes a must if empathic understanding is truly desired. A good teacher must be an empathic learner of her students in the first place. So here I have some students here. I will say, yes, my whole class is a process of learning my students. Not just uh, I'm teaching, you know, selling something to my students. No, that's not true. So that's number five. Number six, it is also evident from this passage that for this person, empathic understanding is not a reducible to a kind of merely mentalizing effort. Using our subjective imagination simulation and then projecting what we think the person, other person is into that person. It is rather an embodied co-experience of the other person. So incarnations, perspectives, varied circumstances. So other directness or other centeredness is precisely the defining feature of this Zhuangxing empathy. The next part I talk about self-forgetfulness and uh, empathy. <coughs> Western tradition basically neglect uh, the importance, significance of forgetting. Western tradition basically is a tradition of memory. Until nature, things start to be different. But uh, in uh, Taoist tradition, from very beginning, forgetfulness is important. It's important uh, philosophical strategy and the practical capacity. So in elucidating issue of empathy, Western scholars, including analytical and phenomenologists like uh, Edith Stein, I guess uh, uh, Ellen is in zoo. Uh, she wants to hear me about that, but very little uh, because she read my paper. <clears throat> uh, Edith Stein mentioned that disagreement with famous establishing uh, lips in early 20th century, aesthetic theory, think of empathy as projecting of observer's emotion into object of your aesthetic observation, contemplation. So style refused that, but at the same time refused any forgetfulness can play a certain role. So other analytical philosophers also re reject that. I uh, can just use one since we are out of time. Like Dave, forgetting oneself is equivalent to a loss of sense of oneself as separated from the person with whom one is emphasizing. So it is a loss of oneself in the process. That's his 1995 early publication on empathy. But for Taoism here, forgetting oneself is not equivalent to losing oneself in the process. Not meant to negate or blow our everyday experience and the egocentric reset. That's what I want to argue. And uh, I want to argue that uh, you can see from Dave's argument it's difficult 
for theory empathy to achieve balance between self other distinction and going beyond egocentrism. And we can consider uh, Zhang's approach of forgetting oneself as a useful resource for solving the problem. So I argue that uh, not as uh, Dolph said, it's uh, uh, losing oneself, and other analytic philosophers argue you cannot forget oneself, even in an instant. Yeah, I, somewhere I put a, I quote here. But I use uh, Nietzsche to defend my argument. Nietzsche said in his famous uh, genealogy of models, he said that forgetfulness is an active ability to shut this door of self-awareness or memory for a while and to make a room for something new. So I argue that uh, Forgetting oneself can be a crucial step toward empathy. It's a prior condition to empathy. Uh, your ethical agency ability and using memory is not is only temporarily suspended. It can come back. So that's my argument. Uh, for I think uh, you can learn from our Taoist source to uh, continue our debate on empathy. So I shall stop here. Thank you for your patience. Well, that was fantastic. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, hey, okay, so concerning the Taoist view on empathy, would you say, since it is within Taoism, does empathy fall under something that should be practiced under like Wu Wei, you know, like the effortless action, should empathy be one of those effortless actions? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, that's my student in aging thought class and world religion major. Uh, you mentioned something that's important to both. So Wu Wei, like the Taoist teaching of Wu Wei of forgetting oneself, our foundation paves the way for empathy. So uh, I cut those part. It's one coin of two, si two sides of one coin. So I would say uh, like a way of forget oneself is adjacency or accompaniment of empathy. Once you reduce your centricity, focus or attachment on yourself, isn't it easier to be sympathetic or empathic to others? to make you less blind. It's like those stories. They only have their own choice preference, right? So they are blind to others. Therefore, Taoist the teaching of Wu Wei, of forgetting oneself, is very much related. Thank you. Are there other questions from people in the room? Uh, no, you are next. Then Marianne, and then, okay, I've got three. Okay, All right. Cool. Go ahead. You're right. doing it. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, well, thank you so much for this. was really interesting. Um, I guess my, uh, just a quick question, or I don't know if it's that quick, but you, you mentioned that empathy is sort of a non inferential capacity, or, or just sort of, it's all, there's almost like an intuitive quality, like Zhuang in that exchange with, was it Hui, is not like reasoning out how the fish feel. Um, and I know there are arguments in chapter two of the Zhuangzi that are interpreted in like a very skeptical or relativistic way, although to be honest, chapter two really, really blew my mind. I didn't really get it too well. But um, do you think maybe there's a suggestion of like the priority of empathy over reasoning as a way of knowing or something like that? Do you think that's a, a reasonable interpretation of what's going on um, in the, some of the passages you've discussed? Oh, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Uh -huh. Because in other parts, I mentioned that the last part of our empathy relationship with other human capacities. So in Zhuangzi, you can see Zhuangzi does use inference, reasoning, reflection. It's just in those stories, maybe not so clear. But uh, in defining Taoist empathy, I must uh, say it's different from uh, reasoning, uh, inference. But they, yes, 
in certain contexts, they prefer, as you say, empathy over reasoning, uh, <coughs> reflection. But they didn't reject. No, definitely not. Yeah. So we are not uh, too far. <laughs> <from Okay. laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. All right. There you are. Next, you don't have to do anything. Just I don't think so. I, I regret that we couldn't hear the whole thing because it sounds like it would really have been. Uh, I can give you a copy. It ah. will be published in July. I ah. passed the two peer reviews, so already revised. <laughs> but but what I'm hearing, if I were to make a succinct statement, is as opposed to the Western concept of do unto others as you want. Uh, as you would have done unto you. This concept is to do unto others as the other would wish to have done unto them. Okay. So it's an opposite, a twist, and that it's the forgetfulness that enables us to get out of our own ego and to be able to do unto others what they would wish to have done unto them. Okay, just wanted to clarify that good, in my own very mind. Very good, your commentary, yes, uh, you are my teacher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I, I totally agree with you that uh, <clears throat> all your points. <laughs> yeah, it's just uh, I didn't use that. Uh, I put it in other parts of my paper. Well, your paper sounds really like something yeah, I'd I love to read. Things. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. That's yeah. very good. All you should do is just talk. You just need to it. just there. Mm -hmm. I guess my question was in the beginning of your discussion, you, I think I missed it. Were you saying effective empathy isn't really empathy? Or you were saying something about one type of empathy not really being genuine empathy. Oh, yeah. I mentioned like pseudo empathy and uh, genuine empathy. So genuine empathy is totally put uh, others in the priority when I try to understand others. So I try to forget myself. So I put my shoes in other, I put my feet in other's shoes in order to understand this other person wear this shoe, what kind of feeling this person will have. That's called genuine empathy. But the pseudo empathy is I put my feet in other's shoes. First, I try to figure out how myself feel. Then, as you mentioned, yeah, that's important. I'm sorry, I go back to the question. Uh, so do I answer your question? That's two part. Now back to you. Uh, your summary is very good. Actually, in my new book, I spent a whole section on that. That's called platinum rule versus golden rule. So you don't think uh, uh, Christianity, Judaism, only uh, golden rule. No, that's not true. The platinum, platinum rule also exists in two Bibles. That's uh, Paul Rico already discussed. So he criticized the golden rule. Now scholars, as one of my friends uh, published in 2005, talk about uh, copper rule or platinum rule is what you say exactly. So implied in my paper. So these two can be supplemental. I don't say golden rule is wrong. That's not me. Other people can say that. I see uh, different meanings, different usages. So in this matter, I follow Paul Ricker. Ricker criticized uh, showing limitation of golden rule, a kind of ethical reciprocity being criticized a lot by Levinas. So that's very popular in Europe. But the recall is a kind of stay on the, in the middle way. So he sees still golden rule at least better than double standard, right? You use yourself and others use one standard, but others even worse. But that's not enough. That's why uh, Derrida or uh, Levinas, Foucault, uh, no, no, Ricoeur talk a lot about it. Uh, the Christian love, unconditional love, without thinking about return. 
that's in Christian man. I'm glad Dr. Fox is here. So we are connected. What? It's a nice idea. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, two things, but uh, we need, these philosophers try to say that uh, that's not enough, gold, uh, golden rule. We need uh, this platinum rule. Uh, all truism is still possible. Right? I, I always talk to my students, uh, in daily life we can do it. All truist, it's not too difficult. Sometimes you become 100% is difficult. For example, I rush into classroom, somebody behind me, I'm already late. Right? I hold the door automatically, spontaneously, without thinking, what's the good for me? No, we don't think, we just hold the other person moving. And other people hold the door for me too. Is that altruistic because at the cost of your own being late? As a teacher, you don't want to be late. As a student, you don't want to show up late, right? Therefore, yeah, recent uh, uh, upsurging of uh, scholarly discussion on altruism with all kinds of religious traditions of ph uh, ethical philosophies. Yeah, I, I'm inspired by them. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. So, so Alan has a question. Oh. <laughs> um, thank you for your talk, Charlie. Can you say more about what Stein thinks about self-forgetting and whether she would agree with your account of empathy? OK, that's a good question. That's a challenging question. Um, <clears throat> as she already read my paper, I uh, discovered that uh, uh, Edith Stein is the only person, maybe another one um, in minor situation, only person mentioning self-forgetfulness. But when she mentioned that, that's her uh, time, uh, 1918 dissertation with Husserl, being translated into English in 1980s. So, Edith Stein, because that's a Catholic nun, being ignored by academia until recently of her book on a problem of empathy. So uh, she mentioned that she disagrees with lips. The oneness, when you be empathic with others or objects or things, so two become one. So, uh, Stein totally disagree with that. Uh, Stein insists on phenomenological difference between self and other. So that's a precondition for empathy. Without self and other, how can you emphasize you know, a priority of other? There's nothing to emphasize. But uh, my argument already show uh, temporarily you can <coughs> maintain that kind of forget Forgetting of oneself. It's not uh, like uh, some philosophers argue, impossible. Not even one instant. That's uh, my book, I quoted uh, his, his recent book, uh, 2019, said that impossible. So I argue with them. I use uh, Nietzsche. Nietzsche, recently, uh, uh, several years ago, a book on Nietzsche's moral psychology. So it's quite uh, inspiring, yeah. <coughs> okay. Um, wait, we have one more. Um, okay. Um, are there questions in the room? I got um, you haven't gotten a chance yet, so you'll go. So then you'll come. We'll come back to you. All right. When you were like when you're talking about like forgetting oneself, like could that also be like a negative impact because in a way like you're forgetting your mistakes and like what you've done in the past. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, Yes, involve forgetting negative things. But uh, it's more than that. Taoist forgetting involves forgetting good things. Uh, for example, you play, we talk a lot in class. <laughs> play basketball, you have a Zen coach. You train so hard, right? Then start to compete with another, maybe the more strong uh, team. The coach said, forget, 
Forget the winning. You just do yourself. You just play, focus on play, every action. Forget winning. We cannot lose. Then you are in trouble. You will be in trouble. So similar to what you say, forget about um, negative. But the positive, sometimes we also need uh, to detach ourselves from, yeah. you know, uh, memory. Yeah, you, you should come to my spirituality healing class. <laughs> we all talk about this all class, whole semester. <clears throat> One second. So you have another question. I already went, but no, it's fine. I, th I think uh, a good amount of what I'm about to ask was clarified by your question and your explanation with this whole golden rule, platinum rule thing. But what really came to mind, especially when you asked your question, um, since Taoist philosophy coexisted with Confucianism, um, and Confucius had that idea of the golden rule, would the idea of do unto others what you want done to yourself and do unto others what they want. Would these ideas have clashed at that time? Or would they have like Yeah, um, the songs, you know, um, didn't do enough uh, reasoning, generalization, uh, inference. So like to use many stories to give you suggestions that you to think for the doing for the job. But uh, in fact, uh, it uh, criticized Confucianism a lot. Taoism, so both Lao Tzu and uh, Zhuang Tzu, both. So on the background uh, is Confucian theory. But uh, many scholars defend on Confucianism. Think about that uh, Taoism is only criticizing certain tendency in Confucianism. Some people uh, mistreat uh, Confucianism or make things worse. So you cannot blame Confucius, Manchus. <laughs> it's just uh, multiple interpretation possibilities. Uh, some people not follow the right path. Therefore, in Confucianism, you can see some teachings echo Taoist teaching. So I, I'm on this group of student, uh, scholars who believe that Taoism and Confucianism are complementary. They place their emphasis on different areas. And eventually, their uh, <coughs> work uh, supplement each other. <coughs> so that's to say that they, they, did, like, they did disagree on things, but overall they were complementary to each other? They also agree on certain things. Yeah, I will say that. Uh, about golden rule, platinum rule, Taoism didn't summarize so clearly what we call. Because Taoism is not a rule oriented. It's different from Kant. <laughs> my, my Kant can call you guys not here. I'm sorry. Taoism <laughs> uh, definitely is not uh, uh, deontic. De is not. They they more close to Aristotle, like uh, virtue ethics. So they set up examples. So called uh, in Western analytic philosopher, most recent uh, example, Larison, is more close in virtue theory. Yeah, I forgot his name, uh, her name. <coughs> so uh, use the example without uh, explaining or set up a golden rule. Golden rule is set up by modern scholars. Confucius mentions never mention that golden rule. And the scholars argue that uh, one passage in Analex, the Confucius uh, uh, recorded sayings, somebody asked, uh, is uh, forgiveness a su? Means forgiving others don't do to others you don't want others to do you, is one word characterize the whole Confucius, Confucian teaching. Now modern scholars say, no, it's not true. Confucius just say, in these things you mentioned, maybe this is important. But not the whole Confucian 
tradition can be characterized as a golden rule. No, that's distortion. I, I totally disagree. So. Yeah, I like uh, your question asking Confucianism. Yeah. All right, so other questions? We good? I think we might be good. That was, that was solid Q and A. Charlie, you have you you defended for you know, fully twenty minutes at least. Yeah, I like a discussion rather than just to no, give no, one I talk. I you had one. We have time. No, go ahead. I mean, yeah. I, th I think mine are like, mine are more about Nietzsche than they are okay. about Confucius, so I'm not that. Yeah. Oh, turn around. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, good. All righty. Um, so just to, quick, just to follow up on his question about the relationship between Confucianism and Taoism, I, I do remember there are some passages where they kind of make Confucius look pretty dumb. Like in the Zhuangzi, yeah, in the Zhuangzi, right? So like, the, I guess like the robber Jur dialogue, where like he goes to talk to this guy who's a robber and a cannibal and all this bad stuff, and he's trying to teach him virtue, and then robber Jur gives the speech that and just kind of takes him to the woodshed, right? And so there are some passages. So I'm wondering if that complicates the picture a little bit, or, um, or maybe, uh, you know. I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I wonder if that complicates the relationship between Taoism and Confucianism. Maybe there is a bit more of a conflict there. I don't know. I, I would say, the, as I said, the agreement, disagreement. There is a bigger disagreement, especially on ethics, morality. So Taoism is famous for its critique of morality. So it's uh, more close to Nietzsche, that's for sure. Yeah, there's uh, so many scholars who acknowledge it. But uh, things are a little bit different. There are different tendencies in this book. Some tendencies try to say that, uh, use the famous uh, Ryan's distinction between how and that, how and what, right? So Taoist ethic is about how to do good to others. Confucian ethics teaches what are good, right? The uh, benevolence, righteousness, make it clear what, like other traditions of religion. But the Taoism focuses on something different. They don't directly deny we completely don't need righteousness, benevolence. Sometimes they make some mark, I acknowledge that. But uh, you find that in other paragraphs, they focus on how you achieve that. Confucius didn't make it clear how to achieve that. And their way is not enough. So let's show our way, the, the Taoists say, for example, empathy. Uh, <coughs> their kind of, uh, uh, all of a sudden forgot the word. <coughs> yeah, those different way like how to understand others, uh, empathetic uh, and uh, intuitive. So they can be supplemental. Yeah, sorry. But, you know, going, going to this Confucius, though, this isn't supposed to be about him. Uh, from, you know, a Freudian perspective of the id, and, and it, it sounds to me that Confucius is very much Get away from your ego, but let your superego be the controlling factor. And that is not what I'm getting from Taoism when he says forgetfulness. It, it's not about allowing that other aspect to be present, whereas Confucius, it always feels to me like he's saying your superego is all that counts, you know, from a Freudian perspective. So I just was curious what your take is on that. <laughs> Yeah, you, you have some reasons to believe that. Um, <clears throat> but uh, Confucian scholars can defend them. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> for example, I mean. <laughs> no, but I was wanting your opinion, not, not the scholars. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not a Confucian scholar, so I'm not <laughs> expert in. Confucianism, that's why I ask you and I give no, back really on that. <laughs> um, because I don't read uh, more uh, scholarly publication on Confucianism. 
modern interpretation of that. I limited it to maybe the Taoist relation with Confucius mentions in early stages. But later, our Confucian didn't develop a lot. So back to your uh, question that, uh, <coughs> yeah, super ego, Confucian, you can say that. But also, you find uh, some Confucian philosophers also reinterpret those super ego. So you cannot say <coughs> exactly just uh, criticize the individual ego, then uh, super ego, that's our community, society, you must follow. Confucianism involves some things very close to Taoism, I'm sorry to say here, are uh, individual situations. Even though they insist benevolence, righteousness are universal, so you must follow. But how to follow, how to apply ethical principles, you need to understand know, all individual situations. It's more like a virtual ethics. Yeah, or or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So that's a clear message. So it's uh, hard to say uh, Confucianism is totally wrong. I'm not saying it's totally wrong. I'm just saying in comparison to, to Taoism, Taoism, there's that, it feels like there's that separation. Yeah, but, but the Taoism also sometimes uh, give suggestion to helping others following, sometimes following societal need. They also have this kind of passage. So many scholars read it as individualistic. That could be wrong. With Western lens, you are individualistic society. So you read, I like Taoism. Taoism is more close to us. Actually, it's not. Yeah, ever since the professor Li Zhehou, you know Li Zhehou, uh, he died at 97, mainland philosopher. He started, Confucian and Taoism are complementary. They are different, mm -hmm. but they can play a role complementary for a better society. So you give individual more room like Taoism, but it's not too much, right? So a kind of middle way, I guess two can make a middle way. I'm going to ask, first of all, that we thank Professor Wong for a fascinating talk and a fascinating <laughs>